different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Happy days are here again, people, drinking my drink, smoking my smoke, and looking to shine the spotlight in one of the many dark corners commonly glossed over or ignored by many of us, yet featured prominently in the work of today's guest. We do come out pretty hard against the Red Cross and other charities that seem to be nothing more than front groups to siphon more wealth from the masses, and this is important because when I see one guy like Stephen Colbert with a wave of his hand fund every donation request from the schools of North Carolina or see some of the success of direct funding websites, I know there's enough abundance and support out there for the people who are slipping through the poverty crack or suffering in the wake of a disaster, but if we don't call out institutionalized corruption in such a key area as the charity community, we're letting organizations like the Red Cross and United Way clog up the pipes of support, skimming more and more each time until we get to a situation like we had recently with the Red Cross and Haiti. Do you think they're going to be honest about the next disaster? Probably not, but they're still getting funding. I think it's a worthy exploration and includes a few elements and tie-ins I definitely wasn't aware of. And of course, our guest today, John Hamer, is really one of the most premier researchers when it comes to the Titanic conspiracy and the multi-pronged attack from J.P. Morgan and Associates. I'm glad we were able to talk about that too. So because of the way THC splits up, we did a half hour on these corrupt charities, an hour on the Titanic saga, and then a swan song of charities to close it out. And I think all of you guys will get a fair dose of both threads. Even though John is way more used to presenting his work in the written form, I've been doing this long enough to help someone make the best case for their work, and that's what I try to do here. So thanks for giving us your ear, and let's do the damn thing with John Hamer. Boom. Have a drink and a smoke. Listen to the cast. We shine a shiny spotlight. Put criminals on blast The pinstripe men of mourning And families of finance DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild The kids don't stand a chance The kids don't, the kids don't stand The kids don't stand a chance All right, people, sad as it may be, we're well aware that most of the world's respected institutions and trusted official stories would not be so ingrained into our collective consciousness unless they serve some purpose for the nefarious elite and their culture creation machine. So when you hear the names of the planet's largest charities like Red Cross and UNICEF, or you think about a story so ingrained in everyone's mind like the freak accident that sunk the Titanic, you gotta ask yourself if you're being sold a lie. And in many cases, you'll find the truth to be exactly that. And that's where the work of today's guest comes in. John Hamer is a journalist and author who's been setting fire to the Puppet Master's web of lies for some time now, most notably in his books RMS Olympic, which tackles the truth of the Titanic sinking saga, and a brilliant and lengthy conspiratorial textbook called The Falsification of History, Our Distorted Reality, that weighs in at a hefty 700 pages that sets the record straight on a whole host of issues. Today we're getting creative with some truth-telling that's a little off the beaten path, but no less important. It's an honor, a pleasure, and a bona fide treat to have him here. John, my man, welcome to THC. Thanks very much, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, man. Thanks for being here. I am really pumped for this one. I like to do shows about topics that aren't part of the Conspiracy 101 introductory brochure that we all get at the meeting, and this is going to be one of them. It was kind of set in motion when I heard the news that the Red Cross had only built six homes with the half a billion dollars in donations they received for rebuilding Haiti after the big earthquake they had in 2010. And uh, I thought, this cannot be an isolated incident. Even the name Red Cross sounds like something cooked up by a secret society. And I kind of set off to find anyone who tackled this piece of the puzzle to a larger extent. And I came across your work and found several great things to talk about. But I guess to start with the Red Cross, this Haiti situation is far from the first time they've double-crossed the people that they claim they want to help, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it's just an ongoing saga, Greg, to be, to be frank. And I mean, th- this has been going on at least since World War II and, and probably before then, too. Um, the Red Cross were caught red-handed, as it were, <laughs> actually stealing from not just in- individual uh, Red Cross parcels, but on, a, on an industrial scale from Red Cross parcels. They've been absolutely up to their necks in 
in the conspiracy world, if you like, for for a long, long time. And and uh, I suppose the Haiti one is just is just the latest in a long series of stuff that they've that they've got up to behind the scenes. I know you're going to come onto it later, but I don't want to single out the Red Cross for any special attention because, believe me, they're all at it. <laughs> you know, the, the Red Cross is just one one small example, but you can bet your life that if it's got the label of a large charity, then there are all sorts of nefarious things going on behind the scenes. And as I say, the Red Cross is just one of them. Yeah, I mean, your first clue should be that it's a household name and it's lasted for decades. Absolutely. Because they don't just let things like that stick around. No, no. <laughs> I mean, getting a little bit deeper, perhaps, but but it's safe to say that, you know, if a, if a charity has been around so long, it's obviously failing in what it's trying to achieve, you know, is maybe a simplistic way of looking at it, but that, that's what I believe. Um, you know, it's not actually solving the problems it's meant to be there to solve because it's still in existence. So it, it, it's quite a paradox, really. Yeah, I actually think that's a great point. And yeah. in your piece about the Red Cross, you write that the International Red Cross, like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, is an elite-controlled front organization whose true purpose is the complete opposite from their stated purpose. And I think that's really a great way to sum it up. Can you give us a little bit of detail about the actions that they, they've performed that show that they are kind of in it for the opposite of their stated purpose? Well, for example, every time that there's a, a so-called disaster, most of them, as, as many of the listeners will know, are, are uh, far from being accidental. They're, they're all, most of them are contrived anyway. But, but take Hurricane Katrina, for example. The Red Cross always are always at the forefront of the money raising to actually get the funds to supposedly aid the poor victims. But unfortunately, it's been proven time and time again that the money that the Red Cross takes in, the audited figures that the Red Cross publish, though, that, those totals never actually get hmm. uh, put where they need to be. Uh, in other words, to uh, to actually alleviate the suffering caused by the, in inverted commas, in, in quote marks, natural disasters. Time and time again, they've been caught with their, with their hands in the, uh, in the till, so to speak, mm -hmm. and... It's just monotonous regularity that they are constantly being caught out with things like the Haiti thing that you mentioned at the beginning and Hurricane Katrina. The, uh, something else was the, the, the Japanese tsunami. They absolutely blast the airwaves with heart-rending pleas for blood, for money, but I can tell you this, it never actually goes where it's supposed to go or the right amount never actually goes where it's supposed to go. Yeah, you actually have, in terms of some of the things you had mentioned, some of the disasters that had happened, uh, I wrote down here a couple notes. You write that following the disastrous San Francisco earthquake in 1989, the Red Cross donated only $10 million of the $50 million that they raised, and they kept the rest. Also, following the Oklahoma City bombing in 95 and the Red River flooding in 97, most of those donations were withheld as well. So, I mean, we're talking about taking millions of dollars and donating maybe 10% just to make it look like you're actually doing something. And with this Haiti thing, building six houses, it seemed like they just took that greed to a ridiculous level because they're kind of off the radar in terms of anyone prosecuting them because they're in the club. Yeah. Um, but they, they got a little greedy with that one. That one was a little bold. Absolutely. I mean, well, uh, their official position is, uh, you know, their stated position is that they donate 91 cents on the dollar to the causes that they're supposed to go to. But in actual fact, as you say, it's a lot, lot less than that. And personally, I would love to know where that money is going. <laughs> I know where some of it's going, but um, it's a little difficult to prove it, of course. But uh, th there are other instances of it being siphoned away into, into, shall we say, other less worthy causes, shall we say, for example. <laughs> Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Where specifically would you speculate that the money is going? Well, I, I guess it's going into the pockets of the people at the top. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I, I hope I'm not being too uh, unkind by saying that. No. But um, a little while ago, the, the president of the Red Cross, uh, she is no longer now, but uh, Dr. Bernadine Healy was ac actually openly accused of withholding funds. And her arrogant response was that that they had to set up a, a war fund. They weren't withholding funds 
specifically from any given disaster. They were actually using them to set up a war fund. Hmm. She said, it's, it's, it's evolved into a war fund. We must have blood readiness. We must have the ability to help our troops if we go into a ground war. We must have the ability to help the victims of tomorrow. Well, that's not their mandate. You know, she's no right to say that. It's not their business to start collecting money for future wars that may not even happen. They're <laughs> supposed to collect money for disasters that are current and actually deal with those, n not start a fund for something in the future. That's not how it's supposed to work, I'm afraid. And that's just so typical of the, you know, the, the way that charities work, that they're a law unto themselves. They're not really accountable enough to outside organizations the money just falls into a bottomless pit into a black hole and it's never seen again most of the time yeah i thought that was actually a great little quote you had from that previous president because it's just an example of a little crack in the armor we actually get to see through the lie a little bit yeah another example kind of in line with that that war fund thing was after 9 11 or during 9 11 they opened up the liberty fund and this is a great example of the corruption because apparently they got 564 million from donations around the world and only released about 150 million. And that's pretty messed up. That's exactly right. Where did the, uh, the other 400 million go? I'd, I'd love to know, but I don't <laughs> suppose we'll ever, ever find out. Right. There's something I'm going to tell us. <laughs> exactly. So do we know much about who started the Red Cross or how they came to be that could maybe give us some clues as to uh, how dastardly they really are was this a disaster racket as you put it from day one i, I i'm not so sure actually I, I i wouldn't like to go stick my neck out and say that much um i think maybe at the beginning it was meant to be uh beneficial shall we say in in the, in the event of emergencies but it's difficult to say I, I don't really know the answer to that to be honest yeah Apparently, another element to the 9-11 thing that I thought was interesting is they asked for a lot of blood donations, which is a little odd because who would the blood be for? A large majority of the victims would be dead. And, uh, of course, for them, blood is a commodity that they can sell. But you also stated that they also use blood donations for things the public isn't privy to. Now, we've been down a lot of strange rabbit holes on this show. So I'm curious what you think they could be using blood for. Okay. Well, first of all, let me say you're absolutely right. What you say, what you just said. I suppose what I believe that they use the blood for is is uh, are things that perhaps people would find totally abhorrent, and that is satanic rituals, that kind of thing. Again, I don't know whether you really want to go down this road particularly or not. <laughs> and it's a very deep and, and dark hole, I'm afraid, if we do. But I suspect there is that kind of thing going on. Uh, I think most people are aware, most people in the conspiracy world, they're aware that these people, these elite at the top, are well into satanic rituals and and all, and all sorts of murky practices. And I suspect that some of the blood is certainly used in, shall we say, quite unsavory rituals. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm totally comfortable getting weird uh, as much <laughs> okay. as you are. But it is kind of, that's where we get into that area where it's kind of hard to prove. These are rumors and whispers yeah. and speculation, but Absolutely. if they're doing satanic rituals, we hear a lot of things about the pedophilia network of the elite, that kids get used in these rituals. It makes sense that blood would as well. I've also heard that the top, top elite, they're trying to prolong their lives. And uh, in the past, when before they had the technologies of today where we're getting into the transhumanist agenda they used to apparently do like full blood transfusions to try to restore their youth and that's another weird and fringe way they could be using the blood absolutely um yeah i mean there's all sorts of rumors abounding about uh, david rockefeller for example i mean he's, ju he's just turned 100 hasn't he and uh, they say that he's had blood transfusions and heart, heart transplants by the uh, by the bucket load <laughs> to keep him going whether that's true or not it's only speculation but um, it's certainly an interesting idea it is and it's still an interesting fact that they would ask for blood in such high quantities at, at yeah. an event like 9 11 because it doesn't really fit what they should have been going for no i mean obviously relatively speaking uh, on 9 11 there were very few injuries you know comparatively speaking uh, most people died as you said earlier so 
what on earth did they do with all that blood? Uh, presumably they sold some of it, but again, it's all speculation. But uh, it's quite an interesting uh, speculation as to as to what else may have been going on with it. Yeah, it is. And let's talk about the, I guess, the current president of the organization a little bit, Marsha Evans. Do you know much about her? Not a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, to be honest. We do, we do know her salary. You wrote that in 2012, that her salary was uh, $651,000 and or per year, and the total revenue of the Red Cross was well in excess of $3 billion. I mean, you, got, you yeah. can be a devil's advocate and say, oh, a person handling a $3 billion fund should be paid well, but I mean, we're talking close to like six, $650,000. That's a little much. And $3 billion a year, if they really were trying to do good, think about the amount of good that could do on an annual basis. Yeah, and that was in 2012, of course. So, you know, the figures may have changed. I'm certainly, I'm certainly won't have gone down, that's for sure. So they're either similar or, or, or there are they are considerably more. Um, yeah, six hundred and fifty one thousand dollars is an obscene amount of money for someone who purports to be the head of a charitable organization <laughs> to uh, to earn. You know, um, you would think that someone in that position would have a little bit of compassion and say that I will do this job for a reasonable salary. I'm not expecting that that the woman should uh should live on twenty thousand a year or anything, but you know, six hundred and fifty one thousand. I mean, come on, that's taking the uh taking the Mickey. Yeah, that's a little excessive. And when when we're <laughs> talking about these charities, I see a real parallel with groups like the Freemasons who are considered by the mainstream to just be a group of good old guys who get together for a couple of beers and are largely a charitable organization. But then yeah. what they really seem to do is they use the lower level members to actually go out there and do philanthropy and be a part of the community. And that's just a small fraction of their actual wealth. And yeah. then at the top of the pyramid, they're, they've got other agendas, real goals of wealth and power at the top. And I think Absolutely. there's a, a, a kind of a parallel with these charities. There is indeed. I mean, the, most of the you know, workers on the ground floor of the Red Cross and many other big charities don't even get paid. They're all volunteers. And to be frank, they're just being used. I mean, unfortunately, you know, I feel sorry for them, really, because they don't even know what's going on above their heads. They just believe that they're working for a very worthy cause. And, uh, you know, they, they give their time freely uh, and for nothing. You know, it, it's it's a sad state of affairs, really. Oh, yeah. And also the people who donate. I mean, these we. So many people are spread pretty thin, yet they still want to give when something happens. I mean, you use the term in the book, emotional blackmail, which is yeah. such a good way of putting what uh, what these media companies do. And, of course, we know that a lot of different arms of the conspiracy squid work together. And one of those would be the media and another one being these charities. And it seems like when a disaster happens, the media plays a serious role in making sure that United Way and the Red Cross are the first and biggest things you hear about. You also wrote that, uh, like on Yahoo's homepage, they took a spot out, a banner ad for one charity, and they gave it to, of course, the Red Cross. So this is a big circle jerk, and none of this money is really getting where it needs to go. But by playing that role, the media overshadows all these organizations that might be a little more honest. Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually think that, in a way, they enjoy they enjoy laughing at us. I believe um, <laughs> it sounds rather uh, trite, but I, I actually do believe that they they do have a, a good old laugh about it. You know, that, about taking us for mugs. You know, those mug punters. Yeah, yeah. And another element to this, let's talk about these professional charity patrons, guys like Bono, which I always thought there was something off and fishy about Bono and him. Yeah, uh, you know, rubbing elbows with the elite and Absolutely. kissing the queen on the cheeks, but yet he's some big philanthropist. And there's got, I'm like, there's got to be something darker to this asshole. Yeah. And, uh, then also, there's this Robert Geldof guy. I guess he's another one on your side of the pond. Yeah, Bob Geldof. I mean, he he was the uh, some some older listeners may rem remember him as the elite singer in the the pop uh, band the Boomtown Rats in the seventies, hmm. and he's become a so we say like a, a charity entrepreneur, if you like, and he's he's always regarded by the by the masses in in this country anyway as a sort of a 
a hero, a superhero who who looks after the poor and needy, and he and he raises all this money for them. You know, good old Bob. Uh, but really, he's just in league with them. And and uh, one of the things that he organised was the Live Eight concerts in in uh, was it two thousand and five? It was the thirtieth thirtieth anniversary of Live Aid. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether you're a bit too young to remember all that, Greg. But it was all a big charity done for the poor in Africa, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they raised tens and tens of millions. It was a worldwide thing. Mm-hmm. That was all a one big scam, as it turned out, because all they were doing was using the money to pay off the the debts to the to people like the IMF and the World Bank that had lent the third world countries obscene amounts of money, and then completely hammered them with interest rates. And that's all that the money raised was used for to pay off the debts to the to the World Bank and the IMF, basically. Yeah. So it was. A- it was another ripoff. That is one of the elements that I think is most fascinating and kind of complex and uh, something that people probably hadn't put together on their own because I sure didn't. But we have talked to John Perkins, who wrote the book Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And we've been down the road of how uh, they send you know these big multinationals and the elite. They send these people into third world nations, get them to take huge loans they can never pay back, get them to sell off their natural resources to corporations who charge them for their own commodities. And then they get into such debt. And we've heard that story. But then there's another step to it. The second step is to bring in your own crew of Bono and U2 and all these big name acts who do these huge benefit concerts to raise money for the uh, loans that they force these nations to take. They're basically paying themselves off and the poor people are left there still with nothing. Absolutely. Um, You know, they they give us the impression that our hard-earned money is going towards, you know, starving children in in the backwaters of Africa. But in actual fact, it's going straight into the coffers of the IMF, you know, which is totally obscene in my view. It's, It's absolutely outrageous, to be frank. It is ridiculous because they're... They're basically taking the the charity of people around the world who recognize poverty and want to do something about it, and it just never gets there. It's kind of like if a guy takes out a, a massive loan from a loan shark, and then that loan shark then has a fundraiser to pay off that debt. It's just a guy you know, having a party to pay himself, and the, the poor guy is still sitting there. He never had anything to begin with. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that just about sums it up, I think, yeah. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's absolutely disgraceful really what's going on. And, uh, you know, the more people that that become aware of it, then the sooner it will get stopped. But, uh, I I ain't holding my breath right now. I'll tell you (laughs) this, uh, this Geldof guy being another musician. I mean, that is also interesting because there's been a lot of musicians knighted and you point this out in the book too, that if that Geldof has been knighted, so has Bono, and then you rightly followed up with the question, do you think this was for helping third world nations or the bottom line of the IMF, World Bank, and British royal family? Which is a great point, and exactly. it explains the knighting of a lot of these higher-up musicians who do these concerts. I, I mean, I like Elton John, but he was the go-to guy before Bono. Absolutely, yeah. Um, they're all in it up to the little scrawny necks, believe me. Um, <laughs> and any of them that have got to the positions of... of high power that they're in at the moment that they've only done it one way and that's by serving the um the, the establishment basically mm-hmm. uh, i just cannot see any other uh, any way that it's possible to do it and uh both robert geldof and bono have been accused of corruption in their own charities haven't they absolutely yeah bono's charity which is meant to place money in the again in the hands of uh, starving africans uh, again, he's been caught out withholding money. Um, he, he turned over about $12 million, uh, not last year, a couple of years ago. And I think, I can't remember the exact figures now, but it was a tiny, tiny amount that actually found its way to where it should have gone to. Get, gone to. And the rest was just withheld. And again, because they're so unaccountable, nobody knows what happened to that money at all. Right. Yeah, there is no, nobody's watching this money. and No, there's no auditing or, you know either internally or externally auditing the, the, the accounts of these these uh, charities. Right. Should be a serious red flag in today's world. But yeah. you, you uh, also point out in November of 2008, Geldof was paid $100,000 in Australia for a brief speech 
addressing third world poverty. I mean, there's a lot of irony there, too. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, why not do it for free and, and put the £100,000 to, you know, to good use, um, serving the charity that he's supposed to represent? Uh, no, obviously, he pocketed the money. That was his fee. Yeah. But there's also, there's also people that believe, in, and, I, and I guess it's not so uh, ridiculous to believe it, and that is that the big charities are just used, uh, used for tax write-offs. So a, a lot of people like Geldof and Bono, they can use their charities to write off their own taxes. So there's a lot of sort of creative accounting going on in the background, I believe. Yeah, definitely. There's that too. Yeah. And uh, you also say in your piece that the Queen is the patron of over 600 charities. And you write, do you really believe that this woman, head of the most ruthless family on the planet and personally responsible directly or indirectly for millions of deaths worldwide in her own lifetime actually gives a damn about starving children or victims of the wars that her and her ilk are actually responsible for causing in the first place? Somehow I think not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, what else can I say? I mean, that just sums it up really, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, this, is, this, this person is the richest person on the planet bar none. And I doubt that she gives a single penny to charity, to be honest, despite the fact that she is, uh, as you say, patron of around 600 of them. Yeah, it's it's really messed up. And I had never really looked into this. You always hear people say, hey, be careful with your money when you donate. Make sure you know where it goes. Look these things up. Yeah. But if you look these things up on the surface, I mean, the, the Red Cross, the United Way, they've got their asses covered. They've yeah. got uh, websites that look very official, organizations that, you know, audit, not audit, but they kind of rank these charities. And of course, they can be bought off just like the FDA can. I mean, it's just a, another false layer of truth that they think that, you know, people think that they're getting clued into, but it's really just not that way. No, absolutely. They're, they're really, as I say, taking the mickey. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, a complete, uh, it's a complete scam, basically, the whole thing. Uh, I w my advice to anyone is if they want to donate money to charity, and there are some decent charities, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not painting them all with the same brush, um, I would pick a nice, small local charity and donate to that if that's what you want to do if you really feel that you do need to give money but please stay away from people like the red cross mm -hmm. from the wwf and united way as you say and even th and even places like cancer research and i, I don't know whether that will create a, a shockwave throughout the listening community by, mm -hmm. by saying that but uh, it, it won't hear yeah okay i would say that because we uh talked to rick simpson who's a guy who's big on the cannabis oil and rick simpson oil and he claims it's basically a cure for a lot of things cancer being one of them and yeah. we've also heard of other people there was a guy who had uh a sound based, a frequency based technology that was getting rid of cancer cells in the body. So it seems like there's definitely cures out there that have been purposely suppressed for the profits of the pharmaceutical companies, for the profits of the cancer industry. And so it's no surprise that charities like the uh, Breast Cancer Foundation, they're just, again, they're just circle jerks of money for these people to make a lot of money and nothing goes into research because the cures yeah. are suppressed. Absolutely. I mean, you've got to bear in mind that cancer is a, is a trillion dollar industry worldwide, you know, it, and, and the uh, and the raising of money to supposedly cure it is is another massive scam, I'm sad to say. I mean, I, I, and I really hate to say that because I feel that I'm actually denigrating the work of a lot of decent people. Again, at the ground level, everyone that works in these charities a genuine, sincere people who are doing a great job. And I'd be the last person in the world to criticize them for that. Mm -hmm. But like us, they're being absolutely deceived on a grand scale. Right. And, it, and it's just very, very sad, the whole situation. Yeah, and it's definitely important to point out this corruption. And it's not just that it's systemic, that it's part, it's ingrained yeah. in these huge organizations. We have to starve these beasts. Like, it's not helping anyone for the Red Cross to exist, it'd be better if we took that three billion a year that they make in donations and gave it to an organization that was more interested in helping the poor and, and exactly. suffering. That, that, this is why I say give it to local 
local charities, local organisations mm. that you can actually see on the streets doing some good, and that you know, you know, you know where your money is going uh, instead of into this bottomless pit, this black hole, mm -hmm. which you you know you never see again, and neither does anyone else that deserves to receive it either. And one last little piece of the charitable puzzle that I yes. wanted to talk about before we went on to the Titanic is I lifted this from your writings, but you put for every dollar of debt cancellation to the international financial institutions, the G8 will reduce the flow of foreign aid to these countries. In other words, the foreign aid earmarked to finance much needed social programs will now go directly into the coffers of the IMF and the World Bank. Can you uh, elaborate just on the the point of the G8 nations reducing their aid. I mean, cause this is like a double whammy for these third world countries. Yeah, basically, it's just it's just what you've said. Every dollar, every cent, every pound, every penny that goes into paying off the IMF's debt is then reduced from the amount that they provide in ter in terms of ongoing relief back again to Africa, which is which is the way it's meant to work. So if they, let's just use some round figures, let's say that a country in Africa, an anonymous country in Africa, owes the IMF $1 million. It's obviously vastly more than that. <laughs> and then the IMF is paid back $50,000 through some sort of a charitable donation, which was meant to go to the African people. Then the IMF then will reduce its ongoing aid to that country by that amount or by that uh, proportion of that amount so that they actually end up worse off. The more money that you give to charity and is funneled through the African countries into the IMF, the worse off those African countries and therefore the poor people on the ground are. Right. Sorry, I, can't, I don't know if that's clear, but it's, it, it's quite complex. It is clear to me, but that is worth pointing out because it is such a, it, it is a double whammy because it's like they're saying, they're saying to the world or like the IMF is saying yeah. to the world, oh, well, now that Africa has money, we're going to reduce the aid. But they never had money. Exactly. That, that, <laughs> that's more or less sums it up in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> Man, it's, it's definitely dark. I'm glad we talked about it. I want to come back to some of this stuff and maybe oh. a couple other organizations, but I want to make sure we get some of the Titanic saga into the first hour because we have really yet to tackle that on the show with much depth, and okay. you've investigated this heavily, written both a nonfiction book about it as well as a novel based on the hidden reality you uncovered. So where do we start with this one? Well, shall I just give you a little bit of background as to how I came to um, to write the write the books because yeah. I, I think that, that might be uh interesting might not be but it might be <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think that'd be perfect what happened was that you've you've seen the presentation on youtube the stand-up presentation that i did about three four years ago mm -hmm. and that, that it's, it's had about one hundred and sixty thousand hits now so it's mm -hmm. quite popular and, and a lot of people have contacted me through that well about well it must be two years ago now I had a very strange phone call. No, email first it was, I beg your pardon. I had a very strange email. It just said, please give me a call on this number. So I ignored it. I thought, <laughs> no. <laughs> and then I left it for a while. And then I, I eventually it kept eating away at me. And, uh, and this person emailed me back again and said, please call me on such and such a number. And I thought, well, what the heck? What are they going to do? Arrest me over the phone? You know, <laughs> I mean. Um, so I called the number sort of very tentatively and it, and it was this lady and she said, uh, you don't know me, but I, I'm a Hollywood film director and I'm really interested in this version of the Titanic that you've could have come up with. And I said, well, first of all, it's not exactly my version as such. You know, I've, I've done a lot of research on it, but you know, I've, I've been standing on the shoulders of, of the people who did all the original spade work mm -hmm. and I found out a lot of other stuff, but it, it's not re I wouldn't really like to call it my idea. She said, well, anyway, you, 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 you know the story inside out, I guess. And I said, well, yeah, pretty much. And uh, she said, well, I would like to make a film about it. So I said, oh, okay then. She said, but in order to get funding, there needs to be a book first. Hmm. So she said, how would you feel about writing a book about it first off? And then she says, we can take it from there. So I set off on that tack and I beavered away for a few weeks and I... I got the basis of the book together and it was all going on very nicely and I was having cut phone calls every week with her and and uh you know we were we were getting on really well and planning it all etc cetera, etc cetera. 
And then about two thirds of the way, the book was about two thirds of the way complete. And she got back to me and said, I've been in touch with someone who, who, who's interested in helping me to get some funding together, but they say it has to be a novel. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I'd written two thirds written this, this nonfiction book containing all the anomalous facts that I knew about the Olympic story and trying to construct a, a story that I thought was more likely than the official story, if you like. And I was suddenly hit with this bombshell. Well, I've, I've never written a novel before in my life. But with her help, I actually wrote, wrote this novel, which was the, the, a fictional story based on the, the, you know, what I believed was the real story. Mm-hmm. Anyway, to, I'm sorry to ramble on, but to no. cut a very long story short, nothing ever happened with the film because you could never get funding. But it was a nice idea while well, it lasted for about 18 <laughs> months. Um, but that was the story about how it came about that, that there are two books, one nonfiction and one fiction. Um, so I suppose in that sense it wasn't wasted effort because I got two books out of it and it was disappointing in the end, but I suppose it was only to be expected. Hollywood are not really going to fund something that um, you know goes against their version of events, are they? <laughs> They've already driven home the official narrative once before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> once or twice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah. Let's uh, let's get into some of the story itself. I mean, J.P. Morgan, I guess, would be the place to start, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, J.P. Morgan, as a, as a lot of people may know, was a you know quite a a ruthless character. He was he was the uh, he well he was one of the richest guys in the world in his day. I mean, he he was into banking. He was into railroads. He was into all sorts of different. Uh, industrial and commercial aspects and he, he had a lot of fingers in a lot of pies basically mm-hmm. and he was one of the most prominent industrialists in the US in the world if you like at the turn of the last century the turn of the 19th into the 20th century and uh, he had an idea amongst many other ideas that he, that he had um, that because there was such a a great deal of immigration in, into the states from Europe and other places that he, he saw an opportunity to build up a, a shipping line based on a, a different premise to, to quite a lot of the other competitive shipping lines that were going at the time and I'll come on to that in a minute and basically invested a lot of money into uh, a, a shipping line called the White Star Line which was at the time before he bought it it was British owned and so he bought that line and he, he, he brought it into his own shipping conglomerate, if you like, uh, w- which had already been established. He'd got a few different shipping lines, but he brought the White Star Line in, into his, his, uh, his little cartel, if you like, for want mm-hmm. of a better phrase. And so what happened then was he liaised with a company called Harland and Wolf in Belfast who who were shipbuilders and he actually took them under his umbrella as well and and made them part of his conglomerate and they were as i say they were shipbuilders and and he commissioned them to build a series of three liners three sister ships that were meant to be the most the largest and most exclusive and luxurious that the world had ever seen and these were in chronological order, RMS Olympic, RMS Titanic, and RMS Britannic. The Olympic was the first off the production line, and uh, Titanic was the second, and Britannic actually didn't get built till after the Titanic had gone. But um, So for all intents and purposes, it was about the two, the two liners, Olympic and Titanic, and, and that's where, where it all starts to get interesting. <laughs> Uh, do you want me to just continue from there, or sure? Yeah, let's just just walk through the the story as as you uncovered it. Okay, it's 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 quite complex actually because there are, there are two different strands to it which come together and 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 create a uh, a wow moment at the end. <laughs> but it, it's um, I'll do my best, but it, it'll mean skipping about from strand to strand as we go along. Sure. So so please do bear with me. And, and if anything gets confusing, by all means, stop me and clarify it. Will do. Okay. Let me just go back to... So this was about 1908 when the decision was made to build the, 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 uh, the liners, which were going to be called the Olympic class of liners. And then a couple of years after that, and we're moving on to another strand of the story here, in 1910, there was a, 
a meeting at a place called Jekyll Island, mm. which is just off the coast, coast of Georgia on the west coast of the uh, sorry the east coast of the U.S., which was basically a plan to usurp the power to create money from the American government and place it into private hands. A lot of people know that that is the that was the prelude to the beginning of the Federal Reserve Bank, right? Which is the equivalent to the Bank of England in the UK, which is a central bank and which has sole rights for creating money. Mm-hmm. Um, however, this, this was, wasn't without strong opposition from certain mega-rich individuals, and we'll come on to that later. Okay, so they set off, back to the shipbuilding strand now, they set off and built a liner called the Olympic, which, as I said, was the first one off the production line. And it was a brilliant ship it was fantastic it was launched in 1911 which was about 12 months before the titanic um done about four crossings across the atlantic backwards and forwards with great success you know everybody was saying what a fantastic ship and morgan was rubbing his hands with glee you could see all his (laughs) all all his investment coming back to him in next to no time when something really tragic happened not in the sense of the loss of human life, but in in terms of the loss of Morgan's projected uh, income, shall we say. (laughs) What happened was on its fifth journey, as it left Southampton Docks in in England, went down the narrow inlet of water called Southampton Water to a place called the Isle of Wight, which is just the Isle of Wight, which is just off the south coast of England. As it approached the Isle of Wight, it was in a massive collision with a uh, a, Navy, a British Navy warship. Now, this damage was a lot worse than they believed at first. They, they got everybody off it safely. There were no injuries or, or deaths. And the ship limped back into Southampton Harbour to be patched up. But as soon as the divers got underneath and could see the damage, they realised that this was going to be rather a bigger job than perhaps Southampton could uh, cope with because it needed to go into dry dock. And the only dry dock big enough to take her was where she'd been built in Belfast. So they had to get her back to Belfast. Now, it took about four weeks just patching her up just to make the short 600-mile trip back up to Belfast to get her into dry dock where they could do a proper damage assessment and, you know, complete the repairs that were needed. Now, once they got her back to Belfast, which was no mean feat, they realised that... Basically, what they had on their hands was 46,000 tonnes of scrap metal. Hmm. Now, this was a real blow to Morgan because he had put all his eggs in this basket and put a massive amount of investment into the building of these ships. And all the time that Olympic was not on the sea earning money for him, he was losing money massively. And more importantly than that... The British Naval Inquiry found that it was Olympic that was at fault for the accident Mm. and therefore they had to pay for the damage to not only the Olympic themselves, in other words, they couldn't make an insurance claim because it was their fault, but also they had to pay for all the damage to all the repairs to the uh, to the battleship HMS Hawk as well. So it was a double whammy for for Morgan. And, you know, although he was a rich man, he, he wasn't a bottomless piss and he just just couldn't keep chucking money at this this project he had to find a way out of it right so that was that in the meantime titanic is about halfway built at this point and she is being built almost identically to olympic but they're actually making small improvements because obviously with the benefit of experience they've noticed things that could be perhaps done have been a little bit better done on olympic and so Titanic is being is like a super Olympic, if you like. She <laughs> she looks superficially identical, but she's got all the all the latest gadgets, more, more niceties, little bits of improvements that just make it overall a better ship. Mm-hmm. Then eventually they get Olympic back up back on the sea, earning money again. But there's something not right with Olympic, and they know this. It's not running well. It's they're, they're having all sorts of engine problems. They're having problems with the prop shaft, vibration, heavy vibration. And then a couple of voyage, transatlantic voyages later, Olympic actually ran over a, 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 a sunken wreck 
just off the uh, off the coast at Sandy Hook, which is famous for something else as well, isn't it? But we won't <laughs> yeah. get into that. <laughs> but yeah, she ran over a, a wreck, and it and she threw a propeller blade, right? Which is quite serious. Even though she had three propellers, it wasn't the fact that she didn't have enough power with only two. It was the fact that the ship was unbalanced. So she went all the way back three thousand miles back across the water to Southampton with only two propellers, and basically nearly shook itself to bits. Hmm. So when it actually got back to Southampton, it was taken straight back to Belfast for further damage assessment. And it was at that point that I believe that Olympic was deemed irreparable. Okay, so Morgan had a problem. Mm -hmm. I believe that Morgan's answer to the problem was to continue to complete Titanic make her look like Olympic, make Olympic look like Titanic, and switch the ships, and then organize an accident for Titanic or Olympic, whichever one you believe it was, in order to collect the insurance money, because there's no insurance company on earth would have paid out knowing all the damage that had been done to Olympic. Right. They knew that if, because it was quite a common thing in those days for, to, to sink a ship for the insurance money. But that was just doing it as a one-off. When a ship had been involved in so many incidents, and there's a couple of other smaller ones as well, which I'd not mentioned, but Olympic had been, uh, in her short life, she'd been almost battered to death with various different incidents. Mm -hmm. And so I think Morgan saw a way out of that. And the only way he could do it was by swapping the identities of the, sh of the two ships and sinking Olympic as Titanic. But I think things went wrong. <laughs> That does make a lot of sense. I mean, that's how you would get rid of your lemon ship and replace exactly. it with your great untainted ship and yet claim that, oh, this one's the one we've been using forever. Exactly. And, and it wasn't a precedent. That. I mean, this was quite apparently, you know, I've done quite a, a bit of research on this over the years now. And apparently it was quite a common thing to do to do that kind of thing. Uh, maritime insurance fraud was rife in those days. Hmm. And it was a lot easier to do something like that in those days because, you know, you didn't have all the mass media that you have today. There, there was no radio or TV or Internet. There was just the uh, the written press. That's all there was. So it was it was quite easy to cover stuff up like that. You know, I've, I've had people say to me, well, how could, you, how could you do that? People would know about it. Yeah, they would. But, you know, there's a lot of other instances of things that people might know about as well, like 9-11, but they still pull it off. Right. And, and in those days, it was it was even easier because, as I say, there was no mass media. Yeah, man. Looking at the context of the time, I think you're right. And it has gotten harder over time for them to pull off these kind of things. But I do think we still see a lot of moves from the same old playbook. But so, okay, following the two threads of this story, if we're saying J.P. Morgan was trying to kill two birds with one stone with this event, and that's one of the birds, he wanted to get rid of this junked up lemon ship, the Olympic, pass it off as the Titanic so he could collect the insurance money and cut ties with that liability in one fell swoop. That's one of the birds. Talk to us about the other big bird here. What else is going on? Well, the other big bird is, we'll revert back now to the uh, Federal Reserve side of things. There were, there were four major opponents of the Federal Reserve Bank between 1910 and 1913 when it, when it came to pass through Congress. And that was um, Benjamin Guggenheim, who was a, uh, a wealthy industrialist at, at the time. Uh, John Jacob Astor, who was part of the, the Astor family, who were also stinking rich. And a guy called Isidore Strauss, who owned Macy's department store in New York. Hmm. And he was also a very rich guy. Now, these guys had not accrued their fortunes through financial means. And so they were sort of cut out the loop, if you like, in terms of what the financial reserve was going to do. And just in case there's anyone out there who doesn't understand what impact the Federal Reserve would have by its instigation on, on the finances of not just rich people but on ordinary people as well i'll do a little sort of snapshot of that just to put that into perspective sure okay basically what the, the federal reserve would do would remove the authority to create and print money from the u.s government and put it into private hands now this money would then only be lent to government not given 
So they had to pay interest on that money back to the owners of the Federal Reserve, who were some of the rich fat cat bankers like J.P. Morgan, who had instigated it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And Strauss, Guggenheim and Astor and another guy who everyone's probably heard of. Um, Lindbergh? Lindbergh, yeah. Um, Charles Lindbergh Sr., who was the father of the famous flyer. Uh, realized that what would happen is that their own fortunes would be massively eroded by this because they weren't they weren't part of the deal basically they weren't doing it through any sort of uh, benevolence or or feeling of charity towards poorer people they were doing it for very selfish reasons but nevertheless they understood exactly the impact that it would have and of course that's come true now because the federal reserve before the federal reserve was brought into being there was no national debt there was no income tax mm -hmm. and, the, and the country was very wealthy it was you know it was it was probably the wealthiest country in the world at that, that time the states um you know the turn of the last century uh but ever since then it's probably the you know the one that's most in debt because of the federal reserve bank and intrinsic the, the intrinsic way that that works in terms of uh creating debt by creating money which after all is just debt dollar bills are just mm -hmm. a dollar of debt to the Federal Reserve. That's all they are. Right. Um, but it's real debt, not just paper debt. So anyway, that's the background to that. So these four guys um, were vociferously opposed to, to the instigation of the Federal Reserve Bank. And in fact, Astor was on his way back from an extended honeymoon on Titanic to actually instigate a very big campaign against the uh, the formation of the Federal Reserve Bank and he got all his campaign managers in place all along the East Coast and he was going to fund a massive campaign to bring the real truth to the attention of the American people so that you know the, there could be a popular movement against it and pretend it from happening prevent it from happening sorry um, so Morgan was aware of this and, you know, he was very, very angry about what these four guys were doing. And it's my belief that he actually lured, managed to lure three of them onto the Titanic using various means um, in order to sort of, as I say, you keep using this phrase, but kill two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. or in this case three birds, Astor, Strauss and Guggenheim, <laughs> um, in the aftermath of getting rid of the uh, RMS Olympic as well. So it, it was very much a win-win situation for, for Morgan, and I believe that that is actually what happened. Boom, there you go, man. It really is a great story, and I think the motivations are there. I think the evidence is there, which we can dig into more in the second hour. But yeah. just to reiterate the timeline here, 1908, J.P. Morgan buys the White Star, gets that whole shipping line in order. 1910, the nefarious meeting on Jekyll Island to talk about how to get the Federal Reserve into place. 1911, they launched the Olympic. After many problems in 1912, they sunk the Titanic, or the Olympic. Yeah. And then in 1913, on December 23rd, right before Christmas Eve, yeah. the Federal Reserve, when everybody's looking the other way, goes into law. So there it is in a nutshell. Absolutely. A bullet point for every move on a five-year plan. And by removing the opposition to the Fed, he helped to enslave a nation. And here in 2015, they still got us by the balls. I think that makes this pretty important and something that everybody should know about. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, I've got no actual proof of this, but I just think there's a lot... Well, I don't think. I know there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that points to it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done several years of almost full-time research before I before I came up, up with this theory and again I'm not saying that it was mine my original thought I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of other people to, to actually take it one step further if you like but it, I, I've done a lot of unique individual research that, that tends to point my, my, uh, my feelings in that way let's say well said Man, wow, John, that pretty much does it for us. I think we did a great job of shining the spotlight on these little pockets of corruption that are still fairly well masked. So thanks so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Before we do go, would you like to tell the people a bit about your books and anything else you got going on where they can check out other work you've done? Sure. I've got um, 
I've got three books um, at, at, at present that are available for sale. The first one is one that you kindly alluded to, The Falsification of History, which is almost like the conspiracy Bible, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other two are the, the ones that we also mentioned. The uh, one, One's RMS Olympic, which is the non-fiction version of the Titanic story. And the other one is called Titanic's Last Secret. And that that's just a little story that I in conjunction with the film director in Hollywood, um, built around that same true story. Obviously, the, it's a fictional story, but it's based on the true story. Mm-hmm. And um, it's quite whimsical. It's not very uh, serious, you know. Uh, but the, those are the three that I've got in publication at the minute. I am actually working on one, and this is a long project, very much like Falsification of History was too, uh, and it's called Behind the Curtain, and this is an expose of the uh, of the banking industry. Oh, nice! Which got little bits of elements of everything that we've talked about today. Um, but it's um, you know it covers all the Federal Reserve and all the elite families and all the rest of it, and how it's all intrinsically linked. It's similar in some ways to falsification, but it's it comes at it from a different angle. And obviously, there's lots more new information in there because falsification was was written about four years ago, four or five years ago. Um, but yeah, that you know, if anybody wants to buy the, the books, they're available on Amazon.com. Um, just type in my name, and I'm sure you'll find them. It's John Hamer, H A M E R. Very awesome. Yeah, I'm so glad I stumbled into your work. I did buy your book, and I found a lot of other little sagas that I've yet to investigate. No problem. It was actually very convenient because I can tell that it's a huge book. You can you can see that it's got 700 pages in there, and the Kindle edition is only $6. So that's less than a right. dollar for 100 pages. So that's a pretty good bargain. Yeah, it says indeed. <laughs> well, you know, I did find a lot of those, a lot of those little sagas that I haven't seen before, or haven't dove into yet. So maybe down the road we can do another show and hit some of those points as well as some of the things that are going to be in behind the curtain. That would be great. I'd love to do it. Awesome. Well, until then, man. Thanks again, and keep fighting the good fight. Thanks, Greg. Eureka, people! Eureka, indeed. Hopefully, we all learned a little something. Of course, we strengthened the Titanic conspiracy argument in the second hour, but I think we got a full explanation in the first. And within the extra mountain of info that John lays out about this situation, the thing I find most damning that I'll point out is that in a time of a coal crisis where very few ships like this were even supposed to be on the ocean, you have this ship that's from another wing of J.P. Morgan's line called the Californian parked 20 miles away from this seemingly random and unplanned accident. And what were they carrying on board? Well, it's just an empty ship except for 3,000 wool blankets and sweaters. I just think that's too damn coincidental. On top of everything, it shows that they did have some people in place to save some lives, but of course not those key opponents to the Federal Reserve. And I think it's a great piece of alternative history and a way to break people into these types of events. If 9-11 is too hot for your friends and family, talk to them about the Gulf of Tonkin incident or this saga that we talked about today. I mean, this one also provides breadcrumbs to walk them right into the Federal Reserve ball of wax. And if you get that, you kind of get 80 or 90 percent of what's really important out there. And then these charities and this whole putting third world nations in debt, coming in and having a big concert blowout and selling tracks around the world, then reducing the A to them Kansas City shuffle kind of thing, is pretty interesting to me. And there's an article from Snopes that I printed out that has even more information on corrupt charities. I wanted to read it to you guys to add yet another exhibit to the case. And I figured I could do this in the after show as not to take up John's time. This piece ranks the most corrupt charities, and it goes a little something like this. The worst offender yet again for the 11th year in a row is UNICEF. The CEO receives $1.2 million a year, plus use of a Rolls Royce for his exclusive use wherever he goes, and an expense account that is rumored to be well over $150,000 a year. Only pennies from the actual donation goes to the UNICEF causes, Less than 14 cents per dollar of income. The second worst offender this year is Marsha J. Evans. Yes, president and CEO of the American Red Cross. Her salary for the year ending 2009 was $650,000. I think we mentioned that. She also gets six weeks of fully paid holidays a year, including all related expenses during the holiday trip for her and her husband and kids. It's a little excessive. 
And all this means that out of every dollar they bring in, about 39 cents goes to related causes. The third worst offender, again for the seventh time, was Brian Gallagher, president of United Way. He receives a salary of $375,000 plus so many numerous expense benefits, it's hard to keep track as to what it's all worth, including a fully paid lifetime membership for two golf courses, one in Canada and one in the U.S., two luxury vehicles, a yacht club membership, three major company gold credit cards for his personal expenses, and so on. This equates to about 51 cents per dollar of income that ends up going to the charity causes. Fourth worst offender on the list has also been in this spot before. In fact, every year since the information has been made available from the start of 1998, amazingly, here yet again, the president of World Vision, a charity based in Canada. The position holds with it a salary of 300000 plus what also is supplied, a home valued in the seven hundred dollars to $800,000 range, completely furnished, completely paid all housing expenses, including taxes, water, sewer, HD, high-speed cable, weekly maid service, and pool and yard maintenance, fully paid private schooling for his children, upscale automobile, and a $55,000 personal expense account for food and clothing with a $125,000 business expense account. And also get this, because it is a religious-based charity, it pays little or no taxes, can receive government assistance, and does not have to declare where the money goes. Only about 52 cents of earned income per dollar is available for charity causes. Also noted the March of Dimes is called the March of Dimes because only a dime for every dollar is given to the needy, which they source some links for. And also with honorable mention is the Goodwill CEO and owner Mark Curran, who profits $2.3 million a year. Goodwill is a very catchy name for his business because you donate to his business and then he sells the items for profit. He pays nothing for his products and pays his workers minimum wage. What a great guy. So there's just a little extra to think about, a little extra to know. It does seem a little depressing, a little cynical, but this is what's going on. So just be careful, but I guess be optimistic about the amount of people who want to help and are willing to share their income to help a brother out. It's not hopeless. It's just that we're giving it to the wrong people. They had a chance. What have they been doing for the last three decades? So to me, it's again somewhat positive in the end to really look at this and say, oh, so we're not really just leaving half the world to rot. There really are enough of us who care. It's just a few people burning through billions of our dollars. And if we get them out of the way, maybe we can do something right. Another thing John mentioned in the Plus show that I wanted to mention was he brought up the point that when J.P. Morgan was trying to buy the White Star line of ships, it was illegal for a foreigner to own a British shipping company. But the elites just rubber stamped it and made a deal with him that if they ever need the ships during wartime, he'll give them up. Well, that sounds exactly like Sam Walton, founder of Walmart, and his apparent deal with FEMA. Walmart agreed to turn over some of the stores in the event of a national emergency and got paid a huge retainer under the table. Who knows? That's what Jim Fetzer says, and I thought I saw a parallel there that was worth bringing up. I've also been hearing about this AI component to Jade Helm. I might just have to have someone on about it, but some are saying that this whole operation might be a test of AI control for a military operation. It's a thread that's kind of new to me. I have to look more into it, but it definitely freaks me out a little bit. Kind of like a real-life Ultron Skynet scenario. I don't know. I could do this all day, but I am just the stupid stoner host. The guests are the real stars of the show. Thanks to every one of them and all of you. That's it from me, people. Do what you do and enjoy the little extra ammunition for your conspiratorial repertoire that you got here today. And I'll see you soon enough. Your move, banking families, triple crown controllers, and Morgan aligned monsters of financial tyranny. Your frickin' move. Have a drink and a smoke. Listen to the cast. We shine a shiny spotlight. Put criminals on blast. The pinstripe men of mourning. And families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild The kids don't stand a chance The kids don't The kids don't stand The kids don't stand a chance I said the kids don't The kids don't stand 
the kids don't stand a chance We're looking for the answers To questions never asked So we come to the Carwood For the higher side chats The pinstripe men of mourning And families of finance DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild The kids don't stand a chance The kids don't The kids don't stand The kids don't stand a chance I said the kids don't The kids don't stand The kids don't stand a chance We try to get a glance We're working on the numbers Resistance must advance The pinstripe men of mourning And families of finance DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild The kids don't stand a chance The kids don't the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance The kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance As you mop up the remnants of your melted mind, consider this. The high-quality, commercial-free show you just enjoyed is what we call THC-free. But you can spend twice as much time with Greg Carlwood and all his great guests by becoming a member of the Higher Side Chats Elite for just $5. And you'll get the five extended two-hour episodes that come out each month. Because an honest, open-minded, and uncensored exploration into the fringe will never be brought to you by your corporate overlords, but rather must be funded by the loyal listeners willing to take that ride. So join at thehiresidechatsplus.com and on top of twice as much show, get your own easy-to-use RSS feed URL for convenient listening on any device. Suggest guests on your member profile, comb through the archives of all the ones you missed, and continue the conversation even further on the new THC Plus Forum, where you can scratch that higher side itch in between shows with the rest of us and hold your head up high, knowing that your subscription supports a show you love, produces the free version for everyone else, and stands as a small act of rebellion against the